Well, welcome back everybody to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming uh, sheep and goat webinar series. Um, I am Melinda Ellison, the University of Idaho Extension Sheep Specialist and your other host uh, is Whit Stewart, University of Wyoming Extension Sheep Specialist. And your third host is Carmen Wilmore, who's also your speaker today. As we get rolling, make sure that you're following us on Facebook for any updates that we have of upcoming events and other information. Um, we're at UI Sheep and Goats, or you can also follow UW Sheep. Also, join us, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is the University of Idaho Extension Livestock channel. Uh, we post all of the webinars once they're completed for your uh, viewing later on. And today, Carmen will be visiting with you guys about early season breeding of sheep and goats, and I'll let Carmen run with it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Melinda. Um, I'll have to apologize. We are, I'm in my office today and we are preparing for fair. So hopefully there's not too much background noise um, of everyone else in the office getting ready for fair. But if you hear voices that aren't mine, that's probably what they're coming from. Um, so like Melinda said, I'm Carmen Wilmore. I'm the extension educator here in Lincoln County. I, um, my program efforts are mostly in livestock and forages. And then I also own and uh, breed, breed goats. And so today might be a little heavy on the goat side, but I tried to also include um, sheep in this uh, presentation. If I can get my slides to go forward. So the first thing I wanna talk about is um, early season breeding versus out of season breeding. So when I put this presentation together, I really was just gonna focus on early season breeding but there's a lot of crossover um, from early season to out of season. And so I'll probably end up talking a little bit about both of them, but just to kind of define each, um, early season breeding is breeding in June or July to hopefully achieve your kidding and lambing in December and January. And so usually to achieve early season breeding, you would use synchronization protocols using um, seeders and hormone therapies or buck and ram teasing to get those goats and uh, sheep to come into estrus a little sooner than they may than they might just with seasonal breeding. So out of season breeding is a little different. Um, this is breeding actually in the spring to hopefully achieve getting a kidding or lambing crop in the fall. So usually this happens in April and May to get those kids and lambs on the ground in September and October actually before we go into winter. Um, so this, you would typically use some type of photo period therapy, which I'll talk in a little bit, um, but that helps manipulate their melatonin secretion and kind of bring them into estrus in the spring, whereas they normally wouldn't. Um, and then you can also use synchronization and buck and ram teasing to accomplish this as well. So the purpose of early season breeding is to help control your kidding and lambing uh, date and achieve more growth in time for fair season. So um, with our goats, we use synchronization to achieve our early season breeding um, so that we have our goats hitting the ground the first part of January. And we also kid our dairy herd a few weeks ahead of that. So we actually kid them around Christmas so that when the boar goats hit the ground, we have some extra milk if we have to bottle feed them. So that's kind of our practice and how we got into this. Um, it also helps market your lambs and kids earlier in the season. So if they're being born um, in January and you have facilities to care for them if they're born um, in an earlier season, then you can also sell them you know, when they're weaned in early March and April and hopefully capture a little better market um, during that time. It also can help you reach those niche markets of having um, goats and sheep that are the size that people want for a summer barbecue goat or for Cinco de Mayo. I know we have sold a few of our December and January born um, Nubian weathers for barbecue goats because they're about the perfect size um, in May, June, and July that people can use them um, for, for those meals and festivals. So the purpose of our out of season breeding. Um, so this is really used primarily by large dairy operations, sheep and goat dairy operations 
to have a steady supply of, fre of fresh milk. And so, um, you know, if you were to um, have a dairy operation, you want to have a consistent supply of milk all year round. So you don't want to have all of your goats or all of your sheep hitting or lambing all at the same time. So you can use um, out of season breeding to then have some of them kid in the fall and some kid in the spring um, to help manage that better. It also helps control somatic cell count, which is a pretty big um, concern for most large dairy operations because when goats and sheep go into heat, um, that somatic cell count will actually increase. And so if you are um, breeding in the spring, they see less of an increase in that somatic cell count when goats and sheep go into heat. Um, but it still does go up, just not as much of a spike as when they breed in the fall. And it's also important that if you're um, out of season breeding, you'd only have half of your milking does in, in heat at one time, right? And so when you look at your bulk tank, only half of your does are going to have a high somatic cell, the other half wouldn't. So that should help your average somatic cell across your entire herd um, stay at a manageable level where it's not a concern. Um, for those that are purchasing your milk to make it into cheese or for whatever its use is, whatever its use is. So um, it also can help you capture another market for selling those weaned goats um, or sheep in early spring or over the winter. So just a little more clarification on that somatic cell count spike during heat. So it's caused by a cytokine release that occurs during estrus, which causes that rapid deployment of white blood cells into the milk, which then causes um, an increase in your count. Many goats, like I said, um, this reaction is lower during the spring breeding than in fall breeding. And so if you are using um, the photoperiod therapy, which is typical to be done in the spring, you'll actually see less of a spike um, during, that, during that period. So the cytokine that triggers this deployment is different than the one that is released when a goat has a goat or sheep has mastitis. And so it's not necessarily that your spike in somatic cell count is indi indicative of a mastitis issue in your herd, it's just that they're in heat. So it, it might look like you have an issue um, with sanitation, but really it's probably that they're in heat instead. So a couple of um, to just be aware of is the environmental factors. So most goats and sheep in the US are naturally seasonal breeders. So they have more active breeding um, during the seasons with shorter days, right? So that's um, starting in the fall through the winter. And I think most sheep and goat breeders are aware of that. Um, so during those long summer days, we don't see as much breeding. And I'll kind of get into that here in a minute. But it's just important to remember most breeding does occur late summer through early winter. And so what we're talking about today is how to achieve it outside of that window. And um, in general, the doe reproductive cycle lasts 20 to 21 days and the ewe reproductive cycle can last upwards of 19 or as low as 13, but on average, it's around 17. So seasonal anestrus, which is what sheep and goats um, are known to have is affected by the temperature and day length of the reproductive cycle. The condition might prevent females from conceiving during months when survival of the developing fetus would be low. And so evolutionarily, when you think about, um, you know, deer and elk, they have very similar uh, cycles to what sheep and goats have. They go into rut and they breed in the fall, and then they have their calves and their fawns in the spring. That way they have all summer to raise them on green grass so that they're at a good um, size and weight going into the next winter. And so it's the same for sheep and goats. They have very small um, offspring. And so it'd be very difficult if they were to kid in the months of January and February or even November and December, and then have to try and maintain that um, young stock throughout the winter. So that's why, um, that's why they usually will breed in the fall. So it's also important to think if you are trying to breed outside of that fall window, that you have the right facilities to take care of those young animals. So we, we put all of our does, as soon as they have a kid, we put them in a kidding stall. Um, we, we use heat lamps um, just for the first few days to make sure that those kids stay warm enough. And then we also um, have dry stalls that have no wind 
Um, they're not necessarily in a heated barn, but it's definitely insulated. And so they can kind of get a good start before they then go back outside. Um, and we, you know, we live in Southern Idaho, so we do get snow, we do have wind, um, but for the most part, we've, we have not lost any kids just due to the elements. Um, mostly I think because we bring them inside and then we make sure that we don't put them out until um, they can definitely withstand, you know, 10 degrees and 30 mile an hour winds if we get them. Um, so just important to think about that when you think about breeding outside of that normal window. Um, another thing to think about when you are breeding, especially early season breeding, so if you're trying to breed in the heat of July and August, is that pre-attached pre embryo survival can be reduced when humidity and temperatures are high um, during the summer months. So it's some, you know, we can't, we can't control the weather, um, but we can control what we do with our animals during those hot periods. So if it's really hot out, try not to mess with them, make sure that they have a cool um, shaded area so that they don't, they don't get too hot. So a little background on seasonal anestrus and what causes this in sheep and goats is it all starts with melatonin. So melatonin is synthesized and secreted during the night hours where it is converted from serotonin um, through these neural pathways. So when nights start to get longer, they have more time to synthesize uh, the melatonin and it will increase. So the important part here is melatonin is required to stimulate that GnRH secretion, which is the first step um, in promoting cycling of our sheep and goats. And so as those nights get longer, they increase their synthesis of melatonin, which then uh, helps them start those estrous cycles. So this increase in melatonin increases the GnRH, which then elicits the release of FSH and LH in sufficient amounts to maintain that follicular development and initiate the ovulation of our females. Um, this is also important for our males. Uh, the same pathway will stimulate testosterone production and Sertoli cell function in our males. So not only is it something that's impacting our females, but our males as well. And this might be why sometimes you think, oh, my, my does or my ewes are in heat, but my my buck isn't doing anything. And it's probably because they maybe aren't responding to that in the same way that the females are. So just a little background on reproductive physiology of our sheep and goats. Um, in a normal estrous cycle, this is controlled by the relationships of the hypothalamic releasing hormones, gonadotropins, and ovarian hormones. So like I said, um, those, the melatonin, um, acts on the hypothalamus of the brain, which then releases GnRH. That GnRH, um, which I'll talk about a few times, acts on the pituitary gland to then release FSH and LH. And so this is the most important part to start the estrous cycle um, in our sheep and goats. If this doesn't happen, then they're not going to show estrus. And so um, the follicle st stimulating hormone then stimulates the project production of estradiol estrogen um, inhibin and promotes follicular growth. So the estrogen in this scenario is responsible for the demonstration of that estrous behavior. So um, I think we're all pretty familiar with what that looks like. Um, does will kind of flag and um, they're very vocal. My goats are very vocal when they're in estrus. There's a lot of, um, you know, I guess screaming, it's not really screaming, but they just are very vocal. They're calling out, um, you know, looking for that buck. And they also will start mounting each other um, if it's a really strong estrus. It also helps with duct development and the mammary glands, and then the development of those secondary sexual characteristics. So inhibin acts actually as a negative feedback once it's produced enough to inhibit the release of FSH from the anterior pituitary once that doe is actually pregnant. So on the other side, we have um, luteinizing hormone, which stimulates ovulation and promotes the um, formation and function of the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is the structure that is formed on the ovary following ovulation. And so that is responsible for the secretion of progesterone following ovulation. So 
it's important that as they create um, this estradiol, it's fed back to the brain and causes the U to come into heat, right? So then that's when you start seeing the estrus. So the amount of that estradiol being sent to the brain increases the maturing follicle on the um, ovary. So as that gets larger, um, it helps that blood concentration in the estradiol peak and the brain will then release a large amount of LH, which causes the ovulation and for that follicle to be um, ovulated off of the ovary. So after the ovulation occurs, the follicle that the egg was in will collapse and form the CL, and that CL then releases progesterone. So as the increase in progesterone tells the hypothalamus then to decrease the production of GnRH, which results in reduced follicular growth, which then um, <coughs> excuse me, causes the estrus and ovulation to be suppressed. Um, as long as that progesterone level is high enough, it will establish that uh, pregnancy. And, <coughs> excuse me, need to take a drink of water really quick so I can keep talking. Okay. And then if the pregnancy is not established, um, then that progesterone will um, not be produced and the uterus will secrete um, prostaglandin. Oops, sorry, let me go back one slide. Um, it'll continue to secrete that prostaglandin and it'll kind of restart the whole cycle. So um, it's important to kind of be aware of this cycle because as we try to manipulate the cycle to achieve our either early season or out of season um, breeding, we need to just be aware of these interactions and how to regulate and manipulate them. So a couple of methods for our out of season, out of season breeding that I'm gonna talk about today is teasing with a buck or ram synchronization using cedars and then manipulation of the photo period. So a couple of reasons to use estrus synchronization is to help schedule your breedings and kittings around, um, I put vacations and weekends, but <coughs> that might sound kind of silly, but for uh, my husband and I, as he's a school teacher, we try and breed our goats so that they will be kidding um, actually during his Christmas vacation. And so to do that, we are actually breeding right now so that our dairy goats will breed, um, like I said, around Christmas so that they will have milk when our boar goats start um, to kid as well. It's also uh, nice for us using estrogen synchronization because it can be very difficult to detect heat, especially the first heat in some of our goats is kind of hard to detect um, in August and even September to make sure that we're getting them in with the buck once they go into heat. So it helps achieve that breeding outside of the normal season. It can also shorten your kidding and lambing window. So when you use estrus synchronization, you also have to make sure if you're breeding, you know, 10 or 20 does that you have enough space if they all were to kid right around the same time that they could all have um, a kidding pin to get those kids up warm, um, fed, and kind of get a good start on them before you put them back outside. So synchronization with cedars. Cedars are devices that use progesterone to synchronize estrus and use in does. So um, you can buy these easy breed cedars. Make sure to get the uh, sheep size. You can use the sheep size in goats. Um, and that's what, what, what we use in our goats. Um, you can get them through online. We usually get ours from Valley Vet. You can also get them, um, I wanna say at most farm stores that they would have them as well. But you also have to make sure to get an applicator because you really can't do anything with the cedar without an applicator. So it's important um, if, if the applicator does not come with the cedar to also order that as well. So this is just a brief um, synchronization protocol used in uh, use. So it's a 12 day cedar protocol. You would put the cedar in on day one. 12 days later, you would remove the cedar and then give them an injection of PMSG, which is pregnant mare serum, gonadotropin, and then they should 
um, be in heat about 48 hours later. So you could either AI or put the RAM in on that day. There are quite a few different um, sheep synchronization protocols. This is just the one that I was familiar with um, and that I found in most of my research. But definitely if, you're, if you have used and you're looking to do this, consult with your veterinarian um, or Melinda might be able to help you in selecting a good synchronization protocol um, to use with your animals. So this is the synchronization protocol we use with our does. Um, it's a 13 day cedar, cedar protocol. So um, we put our cedar in on day one. After 13 days, we remove the cedar um, and give them a shot of estromate on day 13. A day later, well, 24 hours later, it's important to do it 24 hours later. Don't take out your cedars and then think the next morning you can give your next shot. Um, we give them a shot of PG-600. And then sometimes within the next 12 to 24 hours, they'll be in heat. We usually just put our buck in. Um, but if you, you are using AI, you would probably AI uh, in the next 24 hours. <coughs> Excuse me. So next I'm going to pull up a video um, of us actually putting the cedar into one of our goats. Good. Hi, my name is Carmen Wilmore. I'm the extension educator from Lincoln County. And today we're going to show you how to insert a cedar into a goat. First step, I'm going to have my husband, Alan, show you how to anesthetize um, the applicator. All right, so first thing what we're going to do, want to make sure is we have gloves on, okay? Our applicator has been soaking in a solution of chlorhexidine and water, okay? So we pull the applicator out. We're then going to grab our cedar, okay? We're then going to insert the cedar tail first into the applicator. We'll then grab the wings and fold them over, making sure the applicator goes all the way back, or the cedar goes all the way back into the applicator. We want to make sure that it's in there correctly so it doesn't open prematurely. It goes all the way in and then it can open the correct way inside the goat. Okay, so once we, if we have that, we're going to go back into the sanitizing solution. Okay, we'll then pull this out. We'll dip it into a chlorhexidine lube, just the tip. We'll grab a paper towel, dip this in the sanitizing, sanitizing solution, and we'll use this to clean the, out part of, the outer part of the goat. Okay. We're then going to come over here and make sure that we sanitize the vulva. Okay, we want to make sure that the vulva is clear from dirt and mud and debris to make sure that we're not going to introduce anything into the reproductive tract. <laughs> Come here. Okay. So again, we're going to clean the vulva as good as we can, making sure that we're clean of all dirt and manure. We're then going to take the <coughs> applicator and go in at a roughly a 45 degree angle. This is to make sure that we don't go into the urinary tract uh, and create an infection. Uh, so again, we're going to go in there, insert the applicator fully, and then depress and place the cedar. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go into the vulva and place, making sure that it's in the correct placement, and then we're done. Oh, we may not be able to use that. Good. Okay, well, I hope you guys were able to uh, watch and hear that, but that was just a brief video. We're definitely not uh, movie stars by any means, but we thought since we were out there doing that, we might as well um, show you guys what, it, what exactly it entails to use those uh, cedars. Um, a couple of tips for synchronization is definitely sanitize your tools. Um, our vet set us up with that um, sanitization protocol using the chlorhexidine solution and then the chlorhexalube as well to make sure that we're not introducing any bacteria into our goats um, and prevent any um, infections. So definitely sanitize your tools, uh, wear your gloves, and then also sanitize the goat so that you're not pushing anything 
into um, that vagina, but it doesn't need to be in there. Uh, the other point was insert the applicator at a 45 degree angle. Like Alan said, that's uh, to keep it out of the bladder and into the vagina where it needs to be. Make sure to restrain the animal. Um, for what we were doing, we were just doing a few goats, so we just kind of held them. We didn't put them through any facilities, but definitely if you're going to be doing um, a few animals, it helps to have some type of working chute um, to restrain them so that they're not moving around too much and you can easily um, insert that cedar. And then make a plan for when you want to kid and count back for, from there. So um, down here on the bottom, I have our projected kidding date is Monday, December 21st. And so um, when you count back from there, the best way that I have found to do this is just, um, you can just Google date calculator and you put in the date that you want to kid and then you subtract 150 days, right? Because the um, gestation period for goats is 150 days. So when we subtracted that, um, it showed that we should be putting our buck in on Friday, July 21st. And so then we subtracted back from that to see what day we should put our cedars in. And so that's how we calculated um, when to start our synchronization and then our breeding um, with our buck. And then the last point, which is probably the most important, is definitely consult with your veterinarian. Uh, we got our protocol and um, most of our hormones that we use in our protocol, we also get from our veterinarian. It's good to have that uh, veterinarian client patient relationship um, so that they can help you with this and give you um, a good protocol that'll work with your animals um, and they can help you along the way. So another way to achieve this out of season uh, breeding is artificial lighting. So this is used mostly in the larger um, herds or flocks where they have the ability to keep them under a roof essentially to facilitate this lighting. Um, but it, if goats and sheep are kept under long days artificially simulated by lights for 16 to 20 hours for several months and then return to an ambient day length, uh, many will start to exhibit these fertile cycles during the next few months. So um, if you are using natural breeding, which heats in this type of system are kind of hard to see, so it's recommended to use natural breeding, um, it is also imperative that the buck also be subjected to this controlled lighting. So it's not considered synchronization because in this system you're not all going to have your ewes and your does coming into um, heat all within a couple of days of each other. It'll still be kind of um, a random periodic estrus that they're gonna be coming into. So you're not gonna necessarily have a tight, close-knit um, kidding and lambing period, but they should all still synchronize and um, show estrus in the spring versus the fall. So um, this can cause ewes and does to cycle in April or May, resulting in that kidding and lambing in September and October. Uh, example here is to give females 20 hours of light starting on January 1st for a minimum of eight weeks. Uh, the light intensity has to be at least 70 lumens. And the way to test that is you can borrow uh, light meters from most electricity companies, and you can use those to uh, make sure that there is 70 lumens of light at eye level for your animals. And that's the important thing because they have to be receiving that in their eyes to um, stop that melatonin production, right? Or kind of reduce that melatonin production. And so if they aren't receiving it in their eyes, then it's not gonna make as big of an impact. So make sure to test that um, and using those uh, light meters from your electricity company. So after eight weeks, turn the light off and make sure the females are only exposed to natural light. Um, and then females should cycle four to six week, weeks after those lights have been shut off. Again, should be used for pin breeding because the heats are pretty um, hard to see and usually have short, shortened duration. So just an example of what this might look like. Um, so if you want to kid on day 150, let's say that's October 1st. Um, you need to count back 150 days from that, and that would be your day zero. So day zero is the day 
that um, your breeding period would start and your buck would be introduced. So 150 days back from October 1st would be what? May 1st, was that five months? Or April 1st, um, either way. So you go back to day zero and then go eight, 60 days, so about eight weeks back from that. And that's when your white treatment would stop and then go another 60 days from that and that's when your white treatment would start. So if you start your white treatment on January 1st um, and end that at March 1st, let's say, um, then in two more months, so at the end of April, you should start your breeding period. And that would be how you could um, achieve that fall kid and lamb crop, especially in large operations where you want to have um, maybe two or three breeding cycles every two years, this is another way to achieve that with that artificial lighting. Um, it's also important to think about how you're going to achieve your artificial lighting. So when you think of the time of, you know, how much light we have right now, so our sun doesn't set until, you know, 930, almost 10 o'clock right now, and then the sun is back up at 530, between 530 and 6 o'clock in the morning. And so um, that's almost what you want to imitate, but in January. And so in January, the sun's going to set, you know, around five o'clock. And so if you can have a way to have lights on those animals from 5 p.m. till, you know, 11 p.m., another six hours in the evening, um, and then those lights would shut off from maybe 11 p.m. to 3 or 4 a.m., and then they come back on and are on for the rest of the day, that's how you could achieve the light treatment. So I know um, with our chickens, we use that with just timers on lights in the chicken coop. And so if you can achieve that some way with your um, sheep and goats as well, definitely a controlled barn environment where they would only be, where they would have to be under those lights during those times. So the final way to achieve the early season breeding out of season would be using teaser rams and bucks. So these are males that are rejected as a reproductive sire, but are in good body condition and without lameness or any problem that makes it impossible for them to mount um, the user does. So typically you would take these uh, males and you would vasectomize them so they actually can't impregnate any of the females that they come in contact with. And then <clears throat> um, you would actually put them in a pin with these young ewes or does to kind of prime them leading up to the breeding season. So especially young females, um, they can kind of reject the sire or um, not allow them to be mounted. And so you might miss that first heat and that first estrus. So then they would be, you know, giving birth later in your um, kidding or lambing season and then wean younger or uh, younger and lighter offspring. So if you can use these or rams and bucks to kind of jumpstart that cycle, it can also help get them bred earlier in your breeding season. Another way to do this is leaving your females away from a ram or buck for at least 30 days. And then after those 30 days, mixing them in with the teasers can help have a small synchronization effect so that hopefully they all kind of come into heat at the same time and you might have a closer um, breeding and then kidding and lambing season. I've also seen it where you can just completely remove them um, from, from an area and then put them just across the fence from your females. That can also help synchronize. Or if you have a larger um, pin of females, you can put kind of an enclosure inside of the enclosure and put your males in there so they, they still have um, that common fence to kind of tease and bring those females into estrus and then put the buck or the ram out to achieve that breeding. So a couple of things to keep in mind as you move into breeding season, whether you're doing early season, out of season, or just a regular breeding season, just a couple of things to keep in mind is to make sure that those females and males um, are prepared. So there's a common practice um, called flushing where you increase the nutrient content of feeds um, to your breeding stock a month prior to the start of the breeding season. This helps to improve their body condition um, with helping that supplemental energy uh, being provided to them. It can be accomplished by moving those use and does to higher quality pasture, or if you don't have that option, you can always just feed um, extra grain. 
So the response of this does vary depending on the starting condition of using those. Especially your females in poor condition, they respond a little more favorably to that than those that are over conditioned because they're already in prime condition. Feeding them a little more isn't necessarily going to make them gain at that point. Um, <clears throat> but this has shown to improve your whammy percentage. And I've seen it a lot in our does. We have quite a bit of clover in our pasture. And so we've seen definitely an increase in multiples since we put them on that pasture. We've had a lot more triplets um, and a lot less singles for sure, um, just from having a higher quality pasture leading into our breeding season. Um, it can also show to um, improve the chances of embryo survival rate, having that good quality feed um, during, throughout the breeding season um, to help the implantation of those embryos. Another thing to keep in mind is definitely their exposure to high temperatures and how that can affect the fertility and embryo survival. I'm sure um, hopefully later this year we can get some people that have done research on this, but they have seen um, embryo loss due to temperature stress um, during that first week of gestation. So again, it's really important to um, minimize your handling of your um, females during the heat of the day, especially if you do have to move them try and move them late at night or early in the morning when it's not so hot, and then also make sure they have access to a cool shaded area. And then last but not least, talk about the boys as well. So um, they kind of have the same thing as females. Those high temperatures can be detrimental to their fertility. Um, it doesn't necessarily make them infertile, but it can reduce that semen quality. So they um, either won't have as much semen or it'll be moving much slower and so it won't reach those embryos um, or as many embryos. So it's just important that whatever you're doing um, for your females to help them stay cool, also do that for your males to reduce that heat stress. And I think that's all I have for today. Um, I guess I'll take any questions. Great. All right, so as we go forward, go ahead and add any questions that you guys might have to the chat box. The only one so far is there was a comment on what the regular breeding season is for goats. Um, I think you kind of responded to that already in your talk, Carmen, but maybe you could speak a little on what some of these uh, synchronization type things might do for regular season breeding as well. Yeah, so um, regular season for sheep and goats would be starting at the end of August, the beginning of September, and then going through December and sometimes into January. And so that, that all goes back to the length of the day and also our temperatures um, as our days start to get shorter. That's when sheep and goats start to um, cycle. So, and that's pretty typical. Most um, large operations will breed in the fall for those spring kids. But these are just options to breed outside the window um, if you choose to do so. Awesome. Well, as somebody who is coming up on breeding my own sheep, I have a lot to think about here. I might actually consider doing some synchronizing this year. Tighten up yeah. that window a little bit. So, yes, it's very um, handy when they all kid at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Especially if you're doing it on the side like we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Well, thank you very much for sharing all that information with us. It's always nice to hear from someone who has some experience with some of this stuff as well. So um, I guess as we move forward next week, I'm going to give a talk on um, biosecurity and disease management. So especially if you're planning to purchase any breeding stock this season um, or bring in a new set of ewes or that type of thing, um, just some pointers to keep your flock or herd clean. And um, please fill out the survey as you jump off of the webinar. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you, Carmen. Yep. Thank you.